So I know everyone's excited to hear from our special guest today, and we'll get to him in just a minute. But first, I wanted to talk about last night's tournament. Uh, we had 192 players that entered, entered it, and it lasted, I, I know, four and a half hours. When it got to heads up, I stopped watching and I went to sleep. So I don't know. We can find out later maybe how much longer that went. Um, and as I predicted, we were under 100 players in an hour. So when you're in a tournament like that and you start with 3,000 chips, uh, a lot of people are going to go out pretty quickly. Uh, we had 22 students yesterday qualified for the Thursday game at my house. So I want to ask those who qualified, please stand up. We'll give them a round of applause. I was... Uh, I was sorry not to be one, one of the final 22, um, but we did have, um, I want to make a special mention to Joe Kerrigan. Uh, Joe is not a student in this class, he's a uh, staff member at the Information Security Institute, and I know a lot of the players that were very short stacked when we got down to 24 players were getting nervous, and, then, and Joe has a picture of himself, and he doesn't look 18. And, <laughs> Uh, students were saying in the chat, you know, Joe, are you a student here? Trying to wonder who's going to get those 22 seats. And uh, Joe uh, volunteered not to take one of those seats. I wasn't going to give him one of them anyway. Um, <laughs> but he did come in third place. But what I am going to do, because Joe did so well and he's been attending all the lectures and helped us out with the audiovisual at the beginning of the course, is I'm going to use him as an alternate, which means he's going to come to my house and he won't get a seat initially, but we have 53 players. As soon as someone gets knocked out, Joe's going to come in with a fresh stack and play with you guys. And so it's not going to reduce the number of students that get to play, but he'll still get to play. Um, so congratulations to Joe. You really played well. Um, now I'd like to ask the final table to stand up. Uh, we had 192, so it's really something to make it. I see one there. These guys are great. I actually stayed up and watched the final table. I watched the whole thing, and I thought the play was terrific. I thought you guys played with aggression, and you did a lot of the things that I talked about in class. And I think some of you even had some moves that I didn't talk about that you maybe weren't playing poker for the first time. Um, now, special um, acknowledgement to Sydney. I don't know how to say it. Sydney Thibault, where are you? Stand up. He's in the back. So we're going to have trophies and prizes, but I'm going to do all of that on Friday. So you'll get that, and we'll see you at my house uh, tomorrow night. Um, tonight we have another satellite. All of you have a chance to get into the, to the game. Uh, 22, 21 students will qualify. We're going to start at 7 o'clock, and I now know for sure that you're allowed to enter uh, 10 minutes late, but no later than that. But I don't suggest that you do that. So, Try to be there at 7. Now, if one of the players that was in the 22 that qualified yesterday ends up in the top 21, we're going to go down to number 22. So it's 21 people, not including the ones that are there. And what I'm going to do is I've already sent you guys by email the list of the 22 who made it. And so you should have that list handy if you're in that bubble for the satellite and know that those people don't count and you'll know how many people we're going to take. One last piece of business before we get to our special visitor. I want to do the cash game survey like I did yesterday. So raise your hand if you think you're in the running for the cash, and I'm going to ask you to call out your chip stack. Anybody? Yes, in the back. S louder? 450. Can anybody beat 450? Uh-oh. 480. Uh, any more? As you guys may have noticed, I killed all the cash tables right now for this class, but we, right after class I'm going to start them up again and you guys will have 23 hours to continue competing and we will have a prize and a trophy for whoever wins the cash. Alright, so we are very fortunate to have Steve Daneman with us, one of the real uh, celebrities of poker but also incredible player. I had the privilege and fun of, of having lunch with him today. It was a great conversation, great stories. Uh, but I have a story that he might remember that I wanted to share. Uh, this is a picture of me and Steve on TV. This was streaming in Maryland Live Casino because we had been invited to a show called Poker Night in America. They had several pros, including Greg Merson, who's a main event champion at our table, Jason Somerville, who some of you have heard of, uh, Matt Glantz, and of course Steve Daneman. And how did I get to play in that? Well, they had a call for amateurs 
and they said, we want to have two amateurs play with world-class pros. So I wrote a little essay about how into poker I was, and I sent in some of my writings about poker, and I got a phone call a couple days before saying, you're in the game. Biggest game I've ever played in is 2550 blinds with a $100 straddle, and I had bought in for $7,500, scared out of my wits. Uh, actually came out ahead, had a good game. Had Steve to my right, which was a real pleasure. And then someone who was in the poker room that day sent me this picture that they took with their phone because they were streaming it and they had me and Steve on there. I don't think you've ever seen this picture. So I thought it'd be a lot of fun. So with that, I'm going to turn off the screen until Steve is done talking and hand it over to him. So let's invite Steve Daneman. Who had breakfast this morning? And I don't mean coffee. Whoa. I thought of this number. Before I came, I said, you know, how am I going to open this up? I think, I'm going to, there's a number. And you guys supersede. I thought 17% of you would have had breakfast this morning. That's about it. But uh, <clears throat> I'm Steve Daneman, World Series of Poker. Avi uh, clued me into, I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to walk into a class full of people that have, you know, maybe dabbled in poker or read about poker and you guys are already playing online and could probably beat me I'm sure but uh, it's great to be here um, I've traveled around the world to play poker traveled around the world to do lectures and things like that and uh, I gotta tell you I was telling the ladies up up here earlier the last time I was at John Hopkins University it was 1987 a buddy of mine and I, we snuck in, it was an alumni, lacrosse alumni game, and we snuck into the party, we got free crab cakes and all, and then they put us in preferred seating to watch the game. And two weeks later, they sent us mugs, because they were out of mugs. So I still have the 1987 uh, JHU alumni lacrosse mugs, that uh, um, is a little momentum of the school here, but uh, what, a, what a great campus. So. Uh, I had breakfast this morning also, two eggs, cheese, then I had a 90 minute massage, the lady came to my house, massaged me so I could relax for this event. And of course, you know, that, that blew it up when I drove an hour here from Annapolis and through Baltimore traffic, so, uh, and then, wow, I got to have lunch with Avi. <laughs> <laughs> and if, I'm an accountant, all right? I'm a little bit more fun, flavorful accountant. But we had lunch and it was like watching paint dry. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. Actually, we, we, uh, we had good conversation. He's, he's a much better poker player than I will ever be. And, you know, he started talking about pot odds and this thing and that thing. And I tell you, you know, I, he had me lost. <laughs> he really did. And then, you know, that's the answer to the question last night. Was it the last night the question? No, it was last night. The riddle. The riddle. I'm like, he lost me on the second thing. He said, what is this? And then I said, oh, forget it. I don't, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. Then he wanted to tell me another one. <laughs> I'm like, just, yeah, okay, what's the answer? What's the answer? So, uh, so you guys all play poker, and have you ever, before the class, ever played a, in a poker tournament by a show of hands? Who's played in poker tournaments before? Whether it's a house game or the casino or anything like that? No, okay. Big hands, big hands, anybody got big hands? All right, okay, and then so, who's played in the casino? Because I think, I think he told me your age group's 18 to 21, so you're not really unless you're going to the Bahamas. Anybody been to the Bahamas to play? They used to have the PCA, right? They don't have it anymore. You could be 18 years old and fly down to the Bahamas and play. And of course, anybody been in the World Series, just at the World Series. Do you know about the World Series? So the World Series is like 50, it's in Vegas every summer, it's 50 to 70 events. And if you're, you're lucky enough or good enough, you win a bracelet and a lot of money. Then you have the main event. The main event is the Super Bowl of poker. And you put up 10, there's two requirements, or actually three. You gotta be 21, you gotta put up 10,000, and you have to have a pulse, okay? And the year I was in, it was 5,619 people. And now, you know, it's got up to 6,007. I think at one point, one year in 06, it was like 8,000 people or something. And the prize pool was 10 million. The prize pool when I was in there was seven and a half million. And, uh, that's, First place, yeah, the, not the prize, but yeah, the, the first place was uh, seven and a half million. I was so lucky to win just four and a quarter, second place, as I'm the, uh, the first loser, as they call it, if you're second place. In fact, Joe Hatcham is the guy who actually won the tournament, and he was in an interview, and he said, you know, he's Australian, he said, you know, no one ever remembers second place. Well, 
It's not a day that goes by, I go someplace all in honesty and still today uh, that someone recognizes me from TV because it's ESPN, it's all around the world. And I was a little bit of a colorful character, but I'm an accountant. I said, I'm not really that colorful, but people thought I was. So um, there I was the third day, it's a seven day tournament. The third day I'm walking down the hall of uh, the Rio, is at the Rio. And I, I, right before the room, you go up on the wall, and it's this big wall with the chart, and it shows you where your seating assignment is. And this is just crazy. It's almost chilling. I'm in table 272. It's not a lie. And I told him, and he's like, are you kidding me? I was like, this is the same room number. And uh, so I get my seat assignment, seat at five, so I'm going out, and it's a, it's a huge room. I don't know. You've seen pictures of it on TV, maybe. Or in a and it's hundreds of tables and all these people and I'm walking along and I'm walking along and I come up to the table and it was, there's nobody at the table. And I'm like, God, maybe I wrote the wrong number down. And I look and it says, it's a piece of paper there and it says, advanced to the ESPN feature table. <laughs> Do you know what that means? <laughs> I'm going to be on TV. Holy... I had three goals, three goals. First goal, make it past the first day. Number two, get on TV, no lie. I was gonna wear a chicken suit to get on TV. No, that's no lie. Like, if I could get on ESPN for three seconds and I could show my kids later on in life, that's me, dad in the chicken suit <laughs> on ESPN. And then the third was the cash. There it was, go to ESPN table. I sit down. I call Mark. Mark, you're not going to believe this. Who's Mark? I have a home game on Tuesdays. I started a year and a half before that. $50, a bunch of gamblers. We're gamblers. All my gambling buddies. We play $50 games, two games. We're gambling. We're gambling on what the flop, how many red cards, how many black cards, right? I said, Mark, you're not going to believe this. I'm going to the feature table. He says, get the F out of here. I said, no, I'm serious. I'm going to the feature table. Get the F out. I said, I swear I am. I'll call you back. So I proceed to go up to the feature table. And they give me these things like you did. You wire me up, put this thing in my butt back here and stuff like that. And uh, I'm sitting there and I'm like, wow, this is crazy. Now, third day of the World Series of Poker, we are hand for hand. You know what hand for hand means? So you know this big tournament, right before you get to the money, you play one hand, everyone stops at the table, dealer stands up. And then once all the dealers, it's been clear that everyone stop, then you play the next hand. Sometimes it takes two hours, and it might have that day, and the clock's still ticking. So we're playing hand for hand, and then after hand, each hand, I'm calling Mark, because Mark's the guy at the home game who's calling everyone else and telling them what I'm doing, okay? Mark, yeah, we're hand in hand. Now, third hand in, fifth hand in, the guy, Howard Letter. Anyone know Howard Letter here? Does anybody? Yes, you do. Who's Howard Letter? The professor, like this guy right here, <laughs> this guy. I had another bet, no one would know the professor. Not would know uh, Howard, but the, I go up to Howard the very first day, and I, where are you from? What state? New York. You wouldn't know anything, thanks. <laughs> Who's from Baltimore? Two people, 300 people in here. So I go up to Howard Letter, right, and I said, you are the Cal Ripken of poker. <laughs> Everyone knows Cal Ripken, the Iron Man. He played in like 3,000 straight games. Baseball. He's a baseball guy. <clears throat> he does this. Just nods and walks away. I go to the feature table. Howard Letter is sitting at the table. So now we're involved in hand. Now Howard's raising, and I'm, I'm glad you guys all play poker now, because you know what raising, you're raising the blinds. I, does everyone know what raising the blind is? Does everyone know you're supposed to raise the blind? Who does not know that you're supposed to raise the blinds? Show of hands, it's okay, don't be embarrassed because I've got my hand up. Who is it? You all know, I didn't know. I put $10,000 up in this tournament. Raising the blind, I think you're picking on me. I feel like the little kid in class. He's raising all the blinds up. So we give them to me, I'm the big blind. You know what the big blind is, right? He raises my blind. I look down at 6'8". Now, I'm gonna tell you about my poker, all right. 6'8 is a... It's not hands that I typically play, but the 6-8 is personal to me because they're my keynote numbers. 
6, 8, 15, and 66. I was born 8, 15, 66, and 6 happens to be my lucky 6 because born in 66. I'm in the big blind. He raises. I look down. I call. Flop comes out. Ace, king, queen. He bets. It's not about the hand. It's the precision. It's the thought process. I raise him back. He folds. Hand for hand still, right? Because we're, no, we're getting close to the money. I call Mark. Mark, you're not going to believe this. I go from the table. I'm way over here. I'm way over here. Mark, you're not going to believe this. I just bluffed Howard Letter. <laughs> I said, it looked like someone shot his dog. You should have seen his face. And I go like this. I turn this way, and all the ESPN camera guys are going. I'm like. It's <laughs> a true story. This is a true story. And I'm like, oh, shit. And it's, a, it's on YouTube, actually. Dadman bluffing Howard Letter. And Norman Chad, you know Norman Chad. Norman Chad's, look at this amateur guy. You know, he's bluffing the professor. Up his. Mess with Cal Ripken, right? The hell with him. Bam. So, a couple minutes later, we're in the money. Third goal. Get in the money. So I've accomplished two things that particular day on TV, in the money. Everything else is extra credit. Is that good? $10,000 to buy in. You know what? How much I'm in the money at now? 2,000 bucks, 12,000 bucks. I bet 10 to get 12. That's like going to the Kentucky Derby and betting the six to five shot, right? You guys know math. Something like that, right? Six to five. Who's going to put up 10,000 to win just 12 for now? But during that time period, you could play online. You could enter a tournament for a dollar or $10 or $100 and satellite into this $10,000 tournament. Let's flash back to uh, actually how I got in the tournament. So I had this home game, right? Had this home game every Tuesday religiously. And I had more people that you know, could actually play that wanted to play that couldn't play because there were a limit to like 12 seats. So I had these two tables, these two tables here that I got. And when I started, I, I ordered my poker chips and I invited a couple guys over. Everyone loved this. This is the poker craze now. This is 2003, money maker. And I took a piece of painter's tape and I went down the center in case the chips would fall in. Then I went around with a marker and I went like this. This is where you put your cards. This circle is where you put your chips. And I went around because these guys don't know how to play, right? This is all new back in 03. So, uh, so we got this game, my uh, buddy Jerry. So we're out on the golf course, right? We're out on the golf course, we're drinking, a bunch of people. And I said, hey, I'm going to Vegas next week. He says, yeah. He said, you gonna play in the World Series? I said, I think so. I said, you want some action? He's sure. So Don, who's with us, right? Don says, are you crazy? You're gonna give this guy $5,000? He says, hey, business has been good, why not? He says, he's the worst player. He's the worst player in the game. I said, Don, I am not. You're the worst player. I'm the second worst. <laughs> he shouldn't give any money to you. So <clears throat> I'm waiting for a week. And what's this have to do with poker? It's a good game. What are you doing on there? Is it any good? All right. So a week, I haven't got the check from Jerry, right? So I'm like, wow, I got two more days before I leave. I'll have a crab feast. Who here eats crabs? All right, OK. You do. You're from Baltimore. So I invite Jerry over for crabs. And he comes and he gives me this piece of paper. He gives, it's a check. He gives me a check. He says, shh, don't tell Peg, his wife. She'll kill me. Not really true. Peg is a church. She goes to church all the time. She's a church. She's just, she's not going to, she doesn't care what Jerry has to do. So we had the crabs. The next day, and I'm, he filled me in. You guys know Harrington, right? Dan Harrington, the book, right? You've talked about it. That was the first poker book that I read. It was unbelievable. It's, it's this thick versus the Doyle book is that thick. So Mark and I, we get the book. I'm telling you, if you haven't read it, read it. The Dan Harrington book. And uh, so the second book is coming out the day before I'm leaving for Vegas. And let me just tell you, pot odds, position, this thing, that thing, they're all great. But one ingredient you're missing is luck. You gotta have luck. You are looking at the luckiest guy you've ever seen in your life. I'm telling you. I have three hole-in-ones. We'll get to that later. 
I don't even really, really play golf. <laughs> True story. So uh, uh, I forgot where I was. Um, Harrington. Harrington. So I go in. I go to the bookstore, right? I go down. I find the game, the gaming section. I go down. The, I go down the side. I look, and I'm like, uh, Harrington. Yep. Yeah. It's just volume one. Volume two came out yesterday. Where the hell is it? This is where luck comes into play. I came in from this side. I'm facing the thing. I could leave this way or this way. I happen to choose this way. Joe, luck. I go like this. This kid comes around the corner with a stack of books. Harrington, no lie. I'll take one for me, one for Mark. Out the door to the airport. So I get to Vegas. I've got some gambling money. Jerry's check is still at home, so you're a little shy on that, right? Sitting in the drawer at home, because I don't have time to go to the bank. And I'm out there gambling, because I like to play, anybody play craps here and know about craps? Oh, ho, 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 ho. craps is great. <laughs> craps is the best game ever. It's like, you're at the table, you're yelling, you're drinking, you're smoking a cigar, you're, and everyone has the same goal in mind. Win, let's go, hard 10, hard eight, let's go. So uh, I'm not doing too good in, in uh, Vegas with my gambling money. In fact, I tapped into the, the, uh, the, the buy-in, you know? So I'm down about five grand, right? So I'm like, oh my God, what am I gonna do? So I got two, two, eight TM cards and I can nail them out for a thousand each. So that's the plan. Two, I'll take two days, two and a half, three days. I'll hit the ATM, grab some money, but what am I gonna do in Vegas? while I'm sitting there. Vegas, I'm there to gamble. I love gamble. You gamble? <laughs> Not yet. You will. <laughs> They're going to be gamblers. <laughs> you ever, can I tell them about the one that you stole the ice cream out of the mess hall? You ask her about that. <laughs> anyway, the uh, true story. So uh, I'm sitting by, I'm like, what else am I going to do? I sit by the pool, right? I'm going to read the Dan Harrington book. I got nothing else to do. And I'm under the umbrella at the pool because I don't tan too well. So uh, I said, you know, let's get serious about this. Maybe I'm running bad. Maybe I shouldn't put this 10 grand up. And I tell you, I was, I was really bad at the home game. I, was, I could have been the worst player. And uh, so, <clears throat> I, I take some notes. I got notes all over. I've, I'm a note guy. Who takes a lot of notes? Not like notes in your notebook, but notes on life. Write your notes down. Write your goals down. Write your goals down and, and, and then tape it up in the mirror where you brush your teeth every morning. And as you're brushing your teeth, read your goals over and over. Serious stuff. You read about this stuff. People write books about these things. So uh, I took notes, and I had, I had three goals, like I said. I want to make it past the first day. I want to get on TV, and I want to cash. But then I also had notes. And I pulled my notes out, actually, at the final table, because I got stuck on a hand with Joe Hatcham. And uh, it's YouTubed up. You can w read that, watch that one, too. He thought I had notes on him. I said, I don't know who the hell you are anyway. But uh, so uh, can you guys hear me back there? So, so? Shouldn't sat. I got a row right here. You want to sit here, honey? Um, so uh, the notes. Um, so I wrote notes. I said, you know, if I'm going to spend ten thousand dollars, I'm going to have fun. You like to have fun? You. You got third place, didn't you? No. Well, I, oh, you got sixth place. Yeah. All right. Try tonight. <laughs> so. Uh, oh no, you won though. So you get a seat, right? The first twenty-two gets a seat. Congratulations. You were the top woman on there, weren't you? No. no? All right, close. Second. You were second, right? Second. No one remembers second. <laughs> That's what Joe Hatcham said. Uh, did I tell you that story already? Yeah. Can I tell you it again? <laughs> so, uh, so, so my notes were to have fun. So I write at the top of the notes, have fun. And then the second thing was, you have nothing to lose. Because once you put your money in, right? That's it. You have nothing to lose. It's all gone now, right? And then I had like what hands I was going to play. So I thought about it a couple of weeks before I went at the World Series. And I said, if I don't play a single hand, how far can I go into the first day and just get blinded out? If I don't play a single hand, and I kind of think I figured it out, I can go like two thirds of the day. 
But if I play and win a couple hands, I may be able to make that first goal then, which it wasn't a goal then, but that's what I thought. So I said, I'll play the top 10 hands. Aces, kings, queens, jacks, tens, nines, I don't know, ace, king, ace, queen. But as Harrington says, if you play ace, queen, and you get raised up or re-raised, he could have ace, king, right? And what happens if an ace flops? You're dead in the water, kid, like a fish on the pier, flopping around, right? <laughs> That's my joke. It's not really that good, was it? <laughs> and uh, so, um, so the notes. And then I flipped it over. And what Harrington in the book, he said, not calling a mistake, uh, not calling a raise is only a small mistake. It's really important. Not calling a raise is just a small mistake. So if you ever get into a hand, if you ever go deep in a tournament or something, or, and, and you kind of like think, God, I don't know what to do here. I'm out of position, this thing, that thing. I have a gut feeling. I don't have a read on this guy. The pot odds I learned in class wasn't right and this and that. Just fold it because there's another hand. There's more hands behind that. But if you, you don't do it right and you lose, that's it. So I, I've, I've got my notes together. I've got my goals together. So we're, we're off to the first day. And uh, so I go in this room and all these people, all these poker tables. I go to my table and we start playing third hand in. This guy, some guy raises, this guy pushes all in. Guy named Joe, he's from Maryland, actually made the top 27 that year. How? I don't know. You started with 10,000 in chips. The blinds are 25-25. Now they give you like 50,000 chips. So. I'm like, geez, thank God they broke our table up. So we go throughout the day, and I'm playing. I'm playing my top 10 hands and things like that. And, uh, and I end up, I start with 10,000 in chips. I got 55,500 chips. Look it up, and guess what the next person down is, or who he is. Howard Letter had the same amount of chips as me at the end of the night. Is that coincidence? And then I met him twice. So uh, then we go to the second day. Now, I don't know, you've probably read I'm a little superstitious. Anybody read that? I'm a little superstitious. So I brought this shirt to the World Series. And, uh, and it's a comfortable shirt. I picked it out in the store, and I was there a week, and I didn't, and I wore it the first day. So the second day, I'm trying to figure out what, what am I gonna wear? Well, it must be my lucky shirt. I made it past the first day, right? So I wore the shirt again. And again, and again, and again for seven straight days. <laughs> but, you know, it's not like in poker that you're sweating, like in the gym or anything, you know? And uh, so it didn't stink too much. And, uh, and I, I aired it out. Outside, the windows at the Mirage, they had these little windows you can, you know, push open, but you can't jump out, which is good. So I aired it out. In the morning, I'd go into the pool. I'd go in the pool, and I'd be swimming in the pool and looking up, and I'm like the 13th floor, and I'm like, there's my shirt flopping in the wind. <laughs> it was hilarious. But uh, so then I'd go down to get a cab, and it's like the guy, uh, Frank, he lived on the Eastern Shore. I was talking to him the day before the, the, the uh, cab attendant. And uh, I said, uh, he said, oh, I see you made it to the second day. I said, yeah, man, because we were talking about eating crabs and oysters and stuff the first day. He says, okay, I got a cab for us. Oh, can't get in that one. He says, what do you mean? I said, it's an odd number. What? It's an odd number. I was an even number yesterday. <sighs> okay, all right, Steve. Next. No, can't do that one. It's number three. Next. Zero, does that work for you, Steve? Yeah, that's, a, that's an even number. Okay, so I get in there, I get in the cab, because I'm superstitious. I get in the cab and the guy's like, uh, he goes to turn right, I said, whoa, 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 where are you going? He says, oh, we're going to Rio. I said, no, make turn left. He said, no, it's better this way. I said, no, go this way, because we went that, this way yesterday. I said, you want to get tipped? He said, yeah. I said, he said, I'll turn left. <laughs> so I get there, right, so I make it, and he's not real happy with me. He doesn't care where I'm going, just give me my money. So I get there, right, and I said, uh, you gotta, you know, wish me luck. He said, for what? I said, the poker tournament, I'll tell you about it. He said, whatever. I said, you want to get tipped? He says, yeah, I'm going to get tipped because turn, I turned left instead of right. He says, all right, good luck. So I made these cab drivers do that each day. I'm just like, I got this thing in my head. I got, you got superstitions, right? Yeah, you got to, what is one of your superstitions? Uh, kind of like you with a shirt. The shirt, lucky shirt, right? I did change socks and underwear, so that's important. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so that was the second day. The second day I did real well. I think I had 100,000 in chips. And, uh, and now I'm like, just, you know, I'm just enjoying it. And I'm sitting there in the chair. And, you know, and if you just really focus in the chair, 
and I hear, you know, you know at the poker table and you hear the chips clatter and <laughs> the clicking and you're seeing people go out the door that lose. And I said, you know, prepare yourself because that is going to be you at some point in time in this tournament. You are going to be the guy walking down the hall and still hearing the clicks getting softer and softer as you leave the door. And I did. I really prepared myself for that. The funny thing is when the tournament was over, no more clicks, just cheers for the other guy. <laughs> you know, you, you, did you see any of it? He says, Ozzy, 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 ooh, ooh, ooh. That's what the Australians do. Well, my guys are yelling tax man, but they blurted all that out, unless I would have won. That's what you'd have been here. I'm glad I didn't win, actually, because every place I would have won, they was a tax man, tax man, tax man. So we got the second day. We go to the third day. You know about the third day, what happened. And I get through the third day. We're into the fourth day. And uh, you would think someone who went that far for seven days in the World Series got aces a lot, right? Not true. I got aces three times. Joe said he got them like three or four times. <clears throat> I was talking to Ari, uh, Avi about um, aces. And, and my theory on aces, and he agreed to disagree while we were watching the paint dry. And... Um, the, uh, my thought on aces in tournaments are almost like the first two, three positions, it's just limp with them. Because you've talked a lot about position, and if you're limping with them, you get a raise, and maybe another re-raise, then you just stick it to them. And you're gonna have one person calls, and, and by then you're gonna get pot odds if they do call. And all the chips are probably going in anyway. So that's just my theory over the year on aces, and even kings possibly. Um, in the first three positions, uh, just to kind of sneak them. And it's, it's worked a lot of times. And sometimes you just want to limp under the gun with like 2-7, so they know like, oh, he's a limper, he's weak. Do it, and that way you can throw it away to build the case later on. So I get into the fourth day, I go in and um, got a moderate amount of chips, and then because I'm not playing many hands, you know, top 10 hands, you just can't sit there and play top 10 hands in most tournaments, you just can't. Now, I believe these, these blinds were about two hours long, and, uh, and you, you go on cold streaks. So I'm, I'm dwindling down, dwindling down, and it's three hours left in a tournament to go to day five. And uh, um, Harrington, if you've read Harrington, you guys know about big blinds now. What Harrington uses an M factor. Did you? Great. So I had an M of five. So that means you're, you're in red zone or something, right? And you just shove. So I get back from thing, and uh, I see the waitress. And I get out and say, come here. I need, a, I need a two Bloody Marys, double Bloody Marys. <laughs> and here's 20 bucks, and I need them now. Because I, I ain't got many chips. She's like, I'm on it. So uh, she grabs me too. Boom, boom. <laughs> here's another 20. Come on, bring them on. And uh, so now I'm excited about that. I got cold chills. And I had, a, I had her like on a rotating copy. I was like, I had two on the table and two on the floor, man. I was, I was going good. And then I get jacks. Shove it all in. Bam! Double up. Love it. And Rod Party, Rod Parday, was sitting next to me. You don't know him. Neither did I. But he was chip leader. And he paid me off, and I think he doubled me up twice. So now, I'm feeling good. I got chips. I got Bloody Marys, and in fact, they write about me like Bloody Mary Steve. I don't know where I got that, but I do like Bloody Marys. <laughs> and uh, so next thing you know, this guy comes at a table, right? Now, I'm, I'm half, I'm really lit, I think. And I said, I said, I'm Steve, what's your name? It was a really friendly table, too. It was so crazy. I talked about aces. I didn't even think about this. There must have been six or seven times that aces came up at the table and got busted. Busted. So he comes at the table and said, Hi, I'm Steve. What's your name? He says, Russ. Nice to meet you, Russ. Hey, I'm from Baltimore. Where are you from? <sighs> Vegas. Wow, cool. That's cool. Second hand then, I bust him. <laughs> <laughs> it's, true. it's a true story. It's a true story. I bust him. He leaves. I said, Russ, nice meeting you. <laughs> I really did. And uh, so the guy, he leaves, and the guy at the table says, you know who that was? I said, yeah, it was Russ. Didn't you hear him? He says, no. He won the 1993 World Series of Poker. I said, well, he ain't winning it this year. <laughs> it's a true story. Ask Russ. You won't fight in America, but 
You won't find him here because he lives down in the islands because he was a guy caught cheating online. And you know, anybody know Mike Matisau, the mouth? You've heard of Mike Matisau, right? So he cheated Mike out of his million dollars that Mike won at the table and another million dollar tournament all within like four months of each other because he was behind the computer. Wouldn't happen now because you have a security company, you have things in place. <laughs> But he was behind the computer. Uh, he was on the other end. So he could he was be playing you and I. I'm Russ, and he's seen everything you have. And you're Mike Mattis out, and he's just cleaning your clock, kid. So he like, like, I think he got indicted or something, but he can't come back. I've seen him in Aruba. He hangs out in Aruba. No lie, yeah, he hangs out in Aruba. And uh, so we've, we've exchanged that conversation a couple times about that day. Uh, so. Uh, at the end of the night, if you've played in, if, or when you, when you go to play in tournaments in casinos, at the end of the night, you make it to day two, the next day, you have to write down your chips. You've got to count your chips. You've got to write it down. You've got to put them in a bag. You've got to seal it. You've got to put your name on there, your player's card number, and stuff like that, right? I'm gone. I am out of this world. I get up from the table. I start walking away. And the dealer yells, Hey, come back here. I said, what are you talking about? He said, you got to bag, you got to count these chips and bag them. I said, I can't even see those chips. I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm going to the Hard Rock. I threw them in my cart. I said, I'll see you over and I'll buy you a beer. Bring a buddy. And damn if he didn't come over. So, uh, man, I got up the next morning. I tell you, halfway through the night, I ain't lying. You've ever had this one night? Probably not yet, but whew, I actually had to put a foot on the floor in the bed. <laughs> This, and it doesn't stop. It, the bed doesn't stop. It really was. I woke up the next day. It's like, you know, and this is not typical. This is all true. This is not typical of what you're supposed to be doing. Um, getting smashed up. So I, I go to the table the next day, the fifth day. Now I got a bag. I've got this bag that I've got. I bought something from the World Series. And I've got this bag I'm trucking around every day. Because this is at the Rio. You're at the Mirage. And uh, it's a long way. And I've got in here, I've got my globe. I bought a globe as a card protector, okay? I've got a pair of socks. I've got some candy bars in there. I've got a pack of crackers. I've got this book, The Zen of Poker, because I figured when things don't go so well, I'm going to read the book as Zen and get me in a state of mind. And I had a pair of underwear in there. And the guys know why I have underwear in there, just in case, you know, something happens. So, uh... But that morning, I packed an extra bag because I know I'm going to lose it at the table. And if I've got to throw up, <laughs> it's, i got an extra bag. Whew. And uh, we were good. So I'm sitting there. Who knows Phil Ivey? You know, Phil Ivey comes to the table. And uh, I'm sitting there. I gotta, I'm chewing on a cup of ice. So it's, we're on break. And I start talking to Phil. He's talking to me. I, I must have been talking to him. And he said, uh, I said, yeah, I'm... Uh, it's so my first time playing a tournament. He says, really? He said, I said, yeah. I said, my buddy put up 5,000. I put up 5,000. He says, wow, nice buddy. I said, yeah, but you know, you called me a dickhead one time. <laughs> he said, he did. Oh, I said, and, and the poker players were just getting into playing uh, uh, golf. He says, well, I said, I, I got a hole in one once, and, um, and he called me a dickhead. He says, well, I said, I actually had three hole in ones. He said, really? And he's really interested, like, because Phil doesn't care about anyone. Nobody. He does. He's, he's his own thing, you know. So I say, yeah, I was at a CPA tournament. And I hit the ball, 129 away on Baltimore, and I, right in the hole, a swish. He's like, really? I said, yeah. I said, you know what I want? He says, no, what? A car? I said, nope. Dozen golf balls. Them cheap son of a bitches. <laughs> I said, the next year they gave a car away. The second hole in one, I was at Rocky Point in Baltimore, and I hit the 265 yards. Now I'm like a 16 handicap, which means I shoot in the 90s. Boop, 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 in the hole. 265 yard par three. Now this is where Jerry mocked me. And <clears throat> we're at this tournament up in West Virginia. I hit the ball. I pull it. We're not sure it's out of bounds. Maybe it's in bounds. I hit a provisional. Boop, 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 in the hole. Par four. 325 yards. But I find the first ball and I end up parring it instead of taking the birdie. And that's when he called me a dickhead. But anyway, that's Jerry. He was 20 years older, nice guy, just, just fun guy. And, um, yeah, just, just a good guy. So now we're, uh, so Phil's there. Now, Phil's impressed, maybe. 
So he's picking on me too at the table. My big blind, he keeps on raising. Again, I don't know that's what you're supposed to do. I'm thinking he's picking on me. I have three million in chips. He does it again, I take, and I had these stacks, and I take this, I go like this. I shove a million dollars in, and he says, did you look at your cards? I said, no. He says, you looked at your cards. I said, I did not. Have you watched me look at my cards? And of course, good poker player knows everyone at the table what they're doing. And you're not supposed to look at your cards until it's on you. Remember that. It's very important because what happens is you look at your cards, and if you're disinterested, you're back on your phone, you're talking to this guy or this. But if you've got a good hand, now you've shut it down, and now you're interested, and three people away from you can tell whether you've got a good hand or whether they should raise or not. Very, very important. So he says, yep, I've been watching you. You haven't been, you haven't been looking at your cards. He says, suppose I have a good hand. I said, well, then I got outs. <laughs> and he folded. And then I went to throw up. <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy, right. how, how am I doing so far? It's all right? all right, not so bad, huh? I won this, I'm just winging it. So uh, now we're done with the fifth day. Fourth day, I'm fifth in chips at the end of the day, I don't know if I told you that. The end of this day, I'm in the top 10. That's really good for a guy who's only played three other tournaments in a casino. That's pretty good, or at least I thought. And. Uh, so the sixth day, we're going to Binion's. Now this is at the Rio. They changed the venue, except the last two days, we're down to 27 people, and we're going to Binion's, and that's downtown Vegas. Who's been to Vegas before, anybody? Okay. You ever been to Binion's? I think they just closed it up not too long ago. Anyway, you go up to the second floor, and it's this little, like, it's about a room this size, a little bit bigger, and it's dark. You get 27 people, three tables, and all kind of media, all the fans of, you know, you had to get passes to get in there. So we're down to 27. And I'll tell you, I'm cheap. I don't know about you, but I just folded to the money. I just, like, when we got close earlier, I folded to the money, and I was just folding. And I, I was intimidated. These are the, this is the cream of the crop. 27 of the best players out of 5,619. Now, we know at least one got lucky, me. And, uh, now we're down to 18 people. And then I get involved with a hand with Joe Hatcham. And uh, you can YouTube this too, it's a great hand. Um, I got pocket nines, he has ace king of diamonds. And uh, raise, call, flop comes out, nine and two diamonds. You have ace king, diamonds, two diamonds of flop. You don't know what I have. And I think, I bet, he raises, and I go all in. What are you doing? Anyone? Right now, we're down to about 18 people. We're at about $200,000 we're going to get. Who had more chips? He had more chips. I would have, I was at the, uh, he maybe had an extra million. So he's on a flush draw, and he's got two overs. <laughs> So he said, you got a good hand there, huh, Steve? I said, uh, yeah. He says, maybe you should check your hand. I check my hand. Put it down. I go, I had a little hat on. I go, whew. He says, I fold. And I showed him my nines. And this is something I did almost every hand. I showed almost every hand that I played. Now, that sounds strange, doesn't it? But I didn't want them to think that I was bluffing. So if I was in it, I didn't want, I want people like, if he's got it, he's got it. I don't want to mess with this guy because he's always got it. And that's how I guess I preserve chips. I don't know. Probably not a good thing now, but again, I didn't know about buying the blinds, buying the guy's blind. What do I know about poker, right? So, uh, yeah, so then we get down to 10 players. And, uh, and that was a hand. I had so many people come up to me and said, you know, Steve, you should just call his raise. I was like, well, what happens if a diamond comes out? Then I'm gone. So, you know, your game is your game. And you, you, Ari's going to tell you the tools. He's going to tell you what to do. You're going to have all these tools and arsenals. You're going to have all these tools in life, you know, your degree and everything else. But you got to kind of feel by your heart. And you gotta, you got you to map your map. you got to write your map. you got to write your goals. you got to write the things that work for you at the table. Maybe you're not comfortable with certain things or you have a certain way, but you listen to other people, what they have to say. Poker, life, career, 
all of those things. And, and they're all important. At least listen to what people have to say. But, uh, but your game is your game. And, and that was my game to expose the cards. Now I do it every now and then or not. A lot of, sometimes I'll raise under the gun in a tournament with only one card blind to mess them all up. Try it. It's hilarious. A lot of times they all fold around. I'm going to have to unteach them a lot of things. After yeah, a lot. <laughs> I do. It's so much fun. And, and like I remember John Raisner. John Raisner like, just shakes his head. He's fold. <laughs> I didn't see my cards. I fold. But uh, so we get down to 10 players. Now we're at a final table, but it's officially not a final table in Vegas because a final table in Vegas is nine players. So we have 10 players. Now you know I'm not playing a single hand. If I got aces, I'm playing kings. Hmm, maybe, maybe not. Because you're guaranteed a million bucks. You're guaranteed a million bucks when you make that final table from 400,000 to a million. That's a lot of money. So we finally, we knocked this guy out. He took forever to knock out, but we knocked him out. And then we're all millionaires, you know? And the guy gets on the house and goes, you're all millionaires! I'm like, yay! And then we got day seven coming up. Well, God, that's two o'clock at night. And I'm telling you, day five, day five was a 10 hour day. That was short. The other days were 12 and 14 hours. Then you get in the cab line for like the first two, three days. And the cab line's an hour and a half. So you're not getting home till like four in the morning. All right. And then you're all jacked up and then you got to get up and hang your shirt out early, you know? So, uh, so now we're down to final table. Day seven, you get in the place, you get home at 2.30, 3 o'clock. People are calling you, they want to come into town, and the wife is chattering in bed. She's been quiet the whole time. Now she wants to talk. Just go to bed. <laughs> Just go to bed. And I wouldn't let her. The first day, she's like, when we come down and see you, I said, ah, I probably won't even make it past the first day. Just, I said, you know, don't, don't worry about it. So I make it past the first day, right? So now, what am I, superstitious? She can't come the rest of the tournament, right? <laughs> Until we go to Binion's, which is a different venue, and then... So I let her come. So then she's chatty Kathy. You know, she's probably counting all the money she thinks she's going to get. And uh, so uh, next day we have an interview at, at 12 o'clock ESPN. But we don't start till 4. And I tell the guy at ESPN, I said, I'm not going to show up. He says, you better show up or you won't play. That was just like a, you know. So I showed up. I was dead tired. Boy, I was dead tired. And we played for like 16 hours. I think it ended up like we started at 4 and we ended up like 8 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> So first hand, final table. First hand, second hand, I get jacks. I look down at jacks. Raise. This guy gets something, re-raises me. He's been picking on me for the last three days. Another guy picking on me. I feel all bullied up. And then Mike Matisau re-raises. I look at jacks again. I said, wow, that's a good hand. I throw it away. And then this guy goes on. He has aces. He has kings. He flops a king. He gets an ace on the turn. And then just all kind of crazy commotions going on. And I'm like, oh boy, that was a free one on me, man. And I think actually a jack flop too. So I was like, oh shit. So I saw all the things. And then, uh, and, and then, uh, so then we get down to eight. Then we get down to seven. And my whole thing is, so I asked the tournament director. I said, I don't know what we're playing. I know what we're playing for the final number, but I don't know all the numbers in between. Do you have some kind of sheet or something you can give me? So he gives me a sheet. And it's like, man, every time you hit, and I want to buy a boat. A new boat. I'm like, every time like someone gets popped out, it's an extra two hundred fifty thousand dollars. That's a lot of money, right? But I got to split it in half. But it's okay. So uh, we're down to seven. We're down to six. And my buddy Jerry, he showed up with his his, his uh, daughter and son-in-law, and I like, got some friends over here and stuff. My brother came, and 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 I'm out of money because I'm I'm a karma guy. I love tipping. I love over tipping. In fact, like the, as each day went by, the cab driver would give him the $100 tip. Man, that feels good. And the guy up front is not expecting $100. He's like, hey, Frank, here's $100. Bucks. Thanks, buddy. So the lady's like, I'm getting waters at the final table, and I'm $100 of water, man. A little bottle of water, $100, bucks, man. Whoa, man, she's loving me. And then, uh, and then I get food. I, I buy food for the table. She brings it. I said, like, you got some food in there? She's like, where the hell am I going to food? I said, she's, I said, go across the street. Here's a couple hundred bucks. She brings back some fruit for all the guys at the table because they didn't bring shit. And uh, so uh, we're down to six people. I'm out of money now. And I want a bottle of water. I go over to Jerry. Now, look, we're already in for a million. We're down to six. We're probably at what, a million and a half or something. He's up 750000 We put up 5000 He says, Jerry, I need some money. I'm out of money. I need some money for water. He gives me 100 bucks. I look at it. 
I said, oh, buy me one bottle of water. I want two. I said, give me a thousand. Well, you say, a thousand? I said, give me a thousand. That's good. Don't worry about it. So we're down to six. Now we're down to five. And every time, at, you know, you lose somebody, they stop the game, they do certain stuff, you know, the interviews and all that crap. So five, we're down to five. I go over to the, over my, my gang, right? I'm like, Beck, that's his sister, his daughter. I said, where's your father at? She says, he was tired. He went to bed. He was tired. He went to bed. We're playing for millions. He gets half. He went to bed. He's my banker for water. So my friend Dave calls. He says, look, my, my friend, he, Dave wasn't there. Dave calls on Mark's phone. My phone's dead. He says, look, Steve, you might want to think about making a deal. If you're going to make a deal, call Skolansky. Skolansky's the number guy. Like, you're the new Skolansky, all right? Call Avi. So he'll figure out chip proportions and stuff. So I go back to the table and I say, any of you guys want to make a deal? And they all looked at me like, dude, you're, you're going out next. You have no shot at this. So uh, little did we know. So we knock out fifth. We knock out fourth. We're down to three. And now they're bringing the boxes of money. You ever seen it on TV where they had the money on the table? They got 13 guys with these cardboard boxes. And they got these guys with these make-believe shotguns and, and machine guns, you know. And they're all dressed in black like gangsters. And they're walking in and they're dumping the money on the table dumping the money on the table, and it's an old poker table, and the they got 13 boxes of money, and the poker table's starting to bend like that, so some guy gets a two by four, props it up underneath there, right? <laughs> and uh, I go over to the table, right? And the guy's whole, sitting there with a gun in his hand, sitting there, and uh, I go over and he says, hey, oh, what are you doing? So I just, you know, it's, this, is, this is my money. Not all of it, but some of my money. So I looked in there, and you see those, those we call them wraps, the wraps of money, so 100 on the top, 100 on the bottom, and one's in between, just so you know. So they don't tell you that. But uh, 7.5 million, supposedly, in hundreds and ones on the table. So I, I, I turned it. So it's three guys left, me, Joe, and Tex Barch. And uh, so uh, I got my hands in my pocket. I'm like, man, what do you do with all that kind of money? And Tex goes, well, man, you just, he's from Texas. So you just roll around in that kind of money. Just roll around in it. <laughs> so we get through, and... Uh, um, we get down to three, and then Tex goes all in, and then I call, Joe calls, and then he gets knocked out, and we get heads up. Now, <clears throat> something I told you about, you know, I read the book, the number two volume of uh, Harrington by the pool. What I didn't tell you, I don't think I told you, was I got that back. Has anybody read Harrington? Don't do the mistake I did. When I got to the back of the book, and the portion, this is a true story. When I got to the back of the book, there's a section, a chapter, on heads up. Read it just in case, because I didn't. And that could have helped me. So we got there, and uh, so I go up to Joe, right? Joe, shake his hand. Good luck. You're the better player. Let's get this done in five hands. Six hands, we were done. But you know the final hand, right? I have ace three. He has seven three. And I tell you, I had a hard time doing the math. I'm sleep deprived. I only, I only sleep four or five hours a night anyway. All right, since college. Because you can't go to college, you can't work, and you can't party and sleep. It just doesn't work, okay? Who here has a job? Anybody work? It's overrated. Very overrated. So, uh, but I'm sleeping. So, so I'm trying to figure out the blinds. Every hand, I still got to kind of figure out the blinds, what the number is, like with the raise thing, three times. You know, it's a 3x. Now it's two and a quarter, but back then it was three times, what Harrington said. And so I, I under-raised. I figured out later, and Joe had pot odds, and uh, so he won. But he flopped the four, five, six, so he flopped the straight. I turn an ace, I got ace three. I turn the ace and I'm open end it, and we get all the money in, and then I lose. They yell, Ozzy, Ozzy. They take me out of there, they take me to the back room, and they interview me. And they said, Steve, how do you feel about second place? You must be disappointed. Are you kidding me, I'm thinking? I said, look, I am the best player in the United States. Because <laughs> he was Australian, right? I swear, I don't know where I came up with that. This stuff comes, I'm an accountant, I'm not witty, remember? I'm an accountant, I count numbers and beans all day. So, uh, yeah, so that's what happened. And uh, I, I play poker now, I play a little bit of poker. You know, I, uh, 
and you're going to think, all right, I won four and a quarter million. I had two partners. Jerry. Oh, listen to this. The hand is over. When we get heads up, Becky calls Jerry. Dad, get down here. Get down here. They're heads up. Who? Steve, who do you think? He gets in there, right? His hair is all messed up. He's, and he's like six foot six. You know, it's, it's all disheveled, you know. And, uh, and I just busted, just busted out. And he goes over to the table and he looks at us. And I was like, I felt bad. I felt bad. Like, I, I let him down. I let Jerry down and win. And I'm like, I'm like, Jerry, look at this hand. Look at, look, I had eight straight hits, seven threes. You're the worst. <laughs> You're the worst. <laughs> so then my friends, right? It was hilarious. In the crowd, I had some friends from different places in the country. We go to March Madness every year in Vegas to watch the basketball. And these guys heard wind of what's going on. So a couple of them got together and they showed up in Vegas, right? Well, they got drunk. They sobered up because it's so long and they got drunk again. And the waitress is coming over and say, look, you got a $600 bar tab. They said, look, my friend's at the final table. He's going to sign. I'll have you sign these. You know, she said, we'll sign these magazines. So they come up to me and they said, Steve, I need you to sign these magazines. I said, I can't do it. Why? Because I'm superstitious. I can't do anything different. I said, after it's over, we will. These guys, as soon as I busted up, I don't even think the guy put the last card down and they were like standing behind me. They're like, sign these for the ladies so we can get off this bar tab. So that's a little side story. But uh, so I play, I play a little bit of poker and, and um, uh, tournaments. I play for fun. I like it. I've been to the World Series thereafter maybe about nine times. I've never cashed. So you only get paid the top, it used to be top 10%, it might be 15 now. But, you know, so I did the average, one out of 10, right? I made the average, pot odds, you know, e EV or what do you call it like that. So, uh, so I, had, I had two partners, Jerry, he got, he got a check, I got a check, and then my other partner is Uncle Sam, so I ended up like 1.3 million, which from four and a quarter, and Joe, seven and a half million, Australia, you don't have to pay taxes on that. Unreal, unreal. So, uh, um, and, then, and then they took us back to uh, the Rio to get our checks, right? So we're so sleep deprived. And we're like, I'm like, Jer, let's get some money and play craps. <laughs> True. So I gave all my buddies, everybody that came to, to Vegas, I gave them $2,000 each, me and Jerry. We both took $10,000. And he opened the private craps table up for us. It was so cool. We were so tired. And we're playing and we lost our asses. But it didn't matter. And it's like, you know, after an hour, everyone's like, we're going to bed. But the really cool thing was this. And this was like the first taste of celebrity I got. People would come to the private craps table and want to play. And the security guard says, sorry, it's a private game. And they were probably looking around like, who the hell is at this table? And there's not much money out there, right? That was hilarious. But uh, so, uh, and what else? Uh, I'm, re I'm recognized all around the world. It's so crazy. It's just, it's just really just crazy. But wear black, though. You go to final table, wear black. You look good on there. Um, I don't know. Could do some Q&A? I don't know. Anybody have any questions? Or I had all kind of other things I was going to tell you, and some things I said things that I didn't say. Yes? Yeah, well, you know what happened to the home game is we were a $50 home game. Now everybody wanted to bump it up. So I think we started playing for like $200 a game and stuff. And then we played for another year and a half or so. And then I got tired of hosting it. I was every Tuesday and just got tired of cleaning all the beer bottles up when the guys would leave and, and uh, everything else. But uh, yeah, we still play, you know, um, we still don't play the home game. You know, everyone's gotten married, has kids and stuff like that. But uh, um, I still play for fun. I like it for fun. But uh, it's, it's not a passion of mine. I mean, it's, it's one of the top 10 things ever happened in my life. Top five, eh. You know, I started my, um, I, I, uh, I started my business, my CPA firm, uh, in, in when I was 23, actually. And um, I, uh, I went to community college, then I went to the University of Baltimore. I didn't really have good grades, and none of the big eight firms wanted to hire someone who didn't have good grades. So I ended up starting my own little thing. And uh, I'll tell you, you know, some of you guys are going to start a business, and uh, what you have to understand, and uh, is in business. I wasn't really in the accounting business. I was in the marketing business. You got to think about that. When you're, when you start your business, you're not doing what you are. You're marketing. You got to get people in your door. You got to get clicks and things like that. So I learned at an early age about marketing. And uh, that's probably one of my top 
three achievements in life was starting my business, and I'm going in my 30th tax season this year. And I tell you, you know, you're in college, I was talking to some people back here, they've got these student loans, you all have student loans, and you're gonna go out of college, and you may not make as much or so, but you, you wanna, um, you, you make good money when you work for yourself. And goals are important, college is important, but books, self-help, confidence is important in life. Confidence is hugely important at the poker table. Uh, because, you know, you gotta trust your reads, you gotta trust what your math is, you gotta trust your game, your strategy. And having good confidence going there, you know, and I always say to myself, when, you know, I, I, not recently, but probably the first five years, I'd buy into a tournament, and back then the tournaments were like 10 grand. Now they've like 3,500 or so, and of course there's some big ones and all, but go in there with confidence, and I'd, I'd you know, you have your little, your little thing that you do, and your, your move that you make, and uh, it's like, you know, I'd go on the, t I'd go, I love Elvis, and I'd listen to my iPod, and it's like when Elvis opens up, he plays the song, you know, and I'd play it on my iPod because I'm walking to the table, I'm strutting to the table, and I'm like, I own this table, every one of them, I own. And I'd sit down, and that's the confidence you gotta have. You gotta do your little thing. So when you sit at the poker table, you gotta feel strong. And you're gonna hear, you know, the ladies are gonna hear stuff from guys, not typically young guys, but old guys, you know. Hey, lady, you played this, why'd you play that thing? And they're, or the young guys, you know. But uh, you just gotta like, like Phil Helmuth. Everyone knows Phil Helmuth? The poker brat, amazing. So I was in a tournament, the Tournament of Champions. And I think, did you play the video yet? And you saw where I gave the little donkey, you know, to Phil and all, right? So we got in a little spat later on because we're down to the final table. This is a tournament of champions, 110 players. Phil was invited, he didn't qualify, he was invited. 110 players, now I'm at the final table and this is like four, four or five months later. I'm like, wow, final table, main event, final table, tournament of champions. Oh, maybe I'm a little bit better than lucky. But uh, so Phil has got his chips stacked and then he goes like this with his chips, he spreads them all over the place. And he does that after every hand. And you can't figure out what he's got. And then he's taking up time. He's taking up a lot of time to stack his chips when it's on him. And then finally I said, Phil, will you please stack your chips? And then I called the tournament director over and I said, to the tournament director, I said, can you get him to stack his chips and leave him like that? And Phil says, let me understand this correctly. What you want me to do is to stack chips that I'm using the antes for. And then like the, the and Phil's the, you know, he's the poker brat. And, and the tournament director says, well, Phil, and, and I'm just, I'm starting to lose it now because like, I'm a super efficient guy and now you're doing something stupid. And I said, uh, you know what? No one should buy your books or CDs. You're nothing but a punk. And the place went crazy. Then the tournament director, and it feels like, you can't call me that. Will you give him a timeout? And the guy's like this. So they didn't give me a, they might have given me a timeout. Maybe like two or three hands, right? But I, I was just crazy. So I'm at the Bellagio. I'm at the Bellagio. All right, so this is going to air, which, which you don't know when I gave the gifts. This was airing Christmas Eve. So on my own, I got Mike a globe because at the Tournament Champions a couple days, he picks my globe up and says, I got the whole world in my hands. And then Phil, so... I go out, I get a globe for Mike, I get a donkey for Phil. And I asked Mike, right before we start the final table, I said, hey, is it okay, I, I did this, is this okay? He says, oh, I got him a gift too. I forgot the gift, what was the gift that he gave him? What was the gift that Mike, Mike gave Phil a gift? Oh, it wasn't in the clip? No. So, uh, yeah, so I give him this donkey, you know, and just the place just roars to hell, you know? So, I'm at the Bellagio, fast forward, oh, what, March? It's already aired on TV, so he must have just saw it. This is so cool. I'm sitting at the poker table at the Bellagio at a tournament, and he comes up to the table and he says, Steve, you look so bad on TV what you did to me. Now, I was at a tournament in January out in LA, and I went up to him and I said, look, man, I apologize to you and stuff. You know, I'm really sorry. I should have probably done that and all. Right. <laughs> and uh, he said, he goes, I said, well, Phil, I already said something to you about this before, and I apologize. He said, I know, but you look so bad on TV. He said, I was hanging out with Michael Jordan the other day, and he says, what's up with that Danaman guy? And I'm sitting there, and the table stops when Phil's there. 
I said, you mean Michael Jordan knows Steve Dannemann? <laughs> I turned back to the table and said, Michael Jordan knows me. <laughs> and then he walks away. <laughs> Oh my God, but he's the best poker player with all the bracelets and he gets it because it's just not poker. He's got this, he's got this thing about him and he's not for the cameras. I think it's just him and it's marketing. It's about marketing because you love to watch Phil on TV. You like when he blows up with somebody and says, ah, oh, you can't, you don't even know how to spell Jax or whatever he said that one time. But, uh, but he's got it because you don't watch these kids at the table. They're like, you know, on their iPod, their head down, you know, they got hoodies on, they're covering their face up, you know. You know, you want to watch Phil, you know, you want to watch Phil, and Phil's made a name for himself. So I actually happened, so I'm at the Bellagio like two years later, and a guy comes up to me, he says, Steve, and a lot of people come up to me, and he says, Steve, that thing you did with Phil, big thumbs up. So this guy comes up, he says, hey, I had shirts made that says, Phil is a punk, and I brought you a shirt. I said, just one? <laughs> so eventually he didn't sell any of them, and he gave them all to me. And uh, so I brought three shirts today. And so that'll be part of the, whatever you decide to do. Okay. All right. And I got a hat in there. I used to have a, I used to have a radio show called the Jackpot Radio Show. And I had it for about six months. It was the only live gambling show on radio in the country, actually the world. And then after six months, the wife got pregnant and we stopped it. But it was fun, because it's all about fun, right? <laughs> so it fills a point. It's hilarious. What other questions? Any other questions? All right. that I have. Oh yeah, did I, did I leave you any time? Fine. Sorry. Let me grab the <laughs> microphone from you though. Let's thank Steve. So, so I, I think that was a, a great, great warm up for the um, math that I'm gonna do now with you. <laughs> if I can put them to sleep after what you just did, that would be a new high in uh, Professor putting the students to sleep. I think the paint is dry here. <laughs> <laughs> so let's turn this back on. Because what I wanted to cover today is, on the, first, on the second lecture, I think I covered a little bit of math. We did pot odds. And the, I ran out of time before I was able to show you a really useful shortcut. Um, and this is perhaps the greatest uh, change of gear I have ever had in a lecture. I'm not going to walk up the aisles. I'm not going to ask you guys questions. And I will definitely not tell you to ever limp with aces. <laughs> yeah, we have some disagreements. Or show your cards. In fact, I have a slide in this deck that I'm going to get to tomorrow. I just already have it in there. And it says, don't ever show your cards. So we disagree on a few things. OK, so what I'm going to show you is a really important rule of thumb. In fact, it's so important that when I play uh, recently in a home game after this course had started, some of my friends that I play poker with asked me if I had taught you the rule of two and the rule of four. And I said, no, I haven't gotten that to that yet. And they said, what? How could you teach a poker course and not teach this? How many of you already know the rule of two and the rule of four? OK, some of you. So the rest of you are going to know it now. So basically, we're in a situation now where you have two cards to come, and you will see both cards. And so you want to do is multiply your outs by four to get your chances of winning the hand. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look at an example. I've got to light up my screen here because it's not showing up. There we go. OK. So let's say that after the flop, after three cards, you have six outs. The rule of four simply tells us that you have a 24% chance of winning the hand. So that's easier than figuring out how many cards are good that are going to help you and how many cards are going to bad for you, right? You want to know the odds against winning the hands, right? So the odds against are three to one, because if you think of 24%, 24%, let's just round it to 25%, that's a quarter if we're going from zero to 100, right? So we have 25% and then we have another 75%. 75% to 25% is 3 to 1, right? Gosh, I feel like I'm, that this room is just dead now <laughs> after what you did. You killed them, Steve. <laughs> I'll just have to think of some, some good story. I don't drink when I play poker, so I, my stories are not going to be as good. <laughs> okay, so the rule of two is if you only have one card left, 
you multiply your outs by two. So let's say you have nine outs on the river, then you have an 18% chance of winning. Now, the rule of four is really kind of a, a shortcut, and it's not entirely accurate. It's a lot more accurate if you make an adjustment to it. So if you have more than eight outs, you subtract out the outs beyond eight that you have to get your winning percentage. So for example, let's say you have 14 outs, your chance of winning is 14 times four, the rule of four, minus 14 minus eight, because that's how many you have in excess of eight, which is 56 minus six, which would give you 50%. Now that's actually a really handy thing to know. If you have uh, 14 outs, you're even money. Okay, is it ever possible for you to make a bad call if you're even money? Even if the pot were zero, if somebody bets and they put out their bet and you're getting one to one, your pot odds are one to one, but the pot's never zero, right? So you're always getting correct odds to call if you have 14 outs but you have to really have 14 outs. You might think you have 14 outs. You may have, for example, two over cards and a flush draw, but the other guy could have a set, so your over cards are no good. We've heard a scenario like that recently. And so you have to really know how many outs you have if you're going to use this. And once you know, so in this slide here, I taught you how to know what your percentage chance of winning the hand is, right? You multiply by four, to get your chance if you're on the flop. If you're on the turn, you multiply by two. But pot odds are going to be in the form of like three to one, four to one. So we have to convert our percentage to, to odds against. But this is pretty easy to do. So let's say you have 12 outs on the turn. You have a 24% chance of winning, right? If you really have 12 outs on the turn. So you divide 100 by the percentage. So, and you can be approximate because these rules are pretty approximate anyway. So if I divide 100 by 24, that means that 100 has four pieces that are 24 long, and subtract one because we're gonna do odds against. So of the four possibilities, one is good and three are bad. So we get three and the odds against are three to one. So this could be something that you can actually do in your head, especially because you're very often going to have the same number of outs. So nine is a very common number of outs to have. Why is nine a common number of outs? Hand, some, yes. Flush draw, right? Eight, straight draw. Six, two over cards. So there are a certain number, if you play a lot of poker and you actually do your homework after each hand, you go back and you do your analysis, you'll find that there are a certain number of outs that come up all the time and you'll memorize. You'll say, okay, I have 12 outs, so I'm three to one. And then you can compute the pot odds very easily by just adding the bet to the pot, dividing by the bet, and that's your, your something to one. So you can tell. So let's do a problem. On the turn, your board is seven, five, six, king with two hearts, and you have six, nine, and your opponent has a pair of aces. There are $200 in the pot, and your opponent goes all in for $100. And the question is, what would you do? So I'm gonna give you a couple minutes, talk to your neighbor. Uh, if you're alone, think about it. And then after I feel that most of you have solved this, then we're gonna ask someone to, to help us out here. Okay, um, let's do this now. How many people here say call? How many people say fold? Okay, almost everybody. So you're gonna use your rule of two to figure out your winning percentage, right? And so how many outs do you have? Let me see somebody with their hand to tell me in the class how many outs. Yes, Lucas, right? Yes. You have 10 outs. Uh, does anybody disagree with that? Maybe I counted wrong, but I, I didn't get 10. Yes? Nine. Why is it nine? What are your outs? Uh, eight, seven, eight, three nines, and, uh, two, six, six, six. Yeah, that's what, I, that's what I think too. So the eights will give you a straight, the sixes will give you three of a kind, the nines will give you two pair. So that's a total of nine outs. Okay, and now we use our rule of two. So nine times two is 18%. And I'm just gonna round it up to 20 because it's easier to deal with 20. And now I'm gonna divide 100 by 20 and subtract one. So that's five minus one, so that's four to one. It's actually slightly higher than four to one because I rounded 18 to 20, so my denominator uh, went a little up, so the number would actually be a little higher. So it's like 4.1 to one or something like that. Actually, that's probably something you could do in your head, right, Lucas? I remember from, from last week. Um, so, then you calculate the pot odds. What are the pot odds? 
Somebody who hasn't spoken yet. Anybody, what are the pot odds in this hand? Yes. Three to one, right, because we're going to take the 200 in the pot and add the 100 for the bet. So that's 300, and that's 300 to one. So the pot odds are three to one, and the odds against are four to one, so we're going to fold, right? And this is how you can do that calculation, but remember it's a very specific situation because you have an all-in, you, you know what the other guy has, and you normally wouldn't, right? So if the other guy has king seven, which is maybe an unlikely hand, but then your two pair outs are no good. But I would say in this situation that you have six, nine, you pretty much can believe that your eights are good and that a six would be good, and a nine would probably be good. Like what kind of two pair does he have? Well, you could be up against a set, so you never know. Let's look at another example where you happen to have x-ray vision and you see your opponent's hand. And so we have a flop of jack, king, four, and you have ace, queen, and your opponent has a pair of sixes. $200 in the pot and the opponent goes all in for 200. Yes? Can you go around the horn or no? What's that? Around the horn for a straight. No. What do you mean? Can you go, he's asking if you can go king, ace, two, three. Ah, you cannot. You either have to have a high straight or a low straight. We could invent a new game where you could do that, but that would change all the odds that I've memorized. So, um, That's what he's been doing. Qualified. <laughs> qualified yet. Tonight is your night. Okay, let's do the wraparound straight tonight. I'll change the rules. Um, okay, so first of all, before we do our math, does anybody have like an intuition or an instinct just from looking at this as to whether you should call or not? Call? Fold. Anybody feel like, yeah, I don't like this one? Okay, the funny thing is that the sixes have a made hand right now and the ace queen does not. So the sixes are sort of ahead in one sense. But if you ran out the numbers and the percentages, well, let's figure that one out. And you know how on TV they'll always show you the hand and then they'll tell you what the percentages are. And even in Poker Stars, you may have noticed when you're all in, it'll show you what your percentage is, which can be really demoralizing. Um, <laughs> The way that this is actually figured out is we're going to use the rule of four. So you have a lot of outs. The tens, three aces, three queens, eight spades. Somebody tell me why it's eight spades and not nine. Yes? Right. You have four tens, so you can't double count the ten of spades. So you're either going to count it in the tens or in the spades, but not both as an out because that's one card. And so you have 18 outs. Now remember a minute ago I told you that if you have 14 outs, you're even money, right? And you should call any bet because uh, the pot plus that bet is gonna give you better odds, right? Well, 18 is ridiculous, right? You are a heavy favorite. In fact, if we do our formula, we multiply 18 times four, and then we subtract 10, right? Because that's how many uh, outs we have above uh, eight is 10, and that gives us 62%. So if you ask me, well, I could never do this in my head, I would say, sure you could. 18 times two, you can do that in your head, 36. 36 plus 36, you can do that in your head, that's 72. 72 minus 10, 62, right? So if you practice a little bit and you find situations that come up a lot, you actually can do a lot in your head. And online, when you're playing, you have to act quickly, but in a live game, it's okay to sit there and do this calculation in your head and figure out what are the odds against me hitting this hand. And I would say that I don't know how many players do this, but when I play poker and I'm in a situation where there's a pot odds calculation, I always do the calculation, always. So if I'm playing at a table for three hours, I'll probably do this calculation seven or eight times during that time. Yes? Couldn't uh, Jacks and Kings also be outs and then count Did I miss any outs? Uh, well, you'd have to hit both of them. For, yeah, so, so when I look at backdoor outs like that, I don't give a lot of credit, but you're absolutely right that if a jack and a king came, then, you know, so maybe we could subtract one out from our total in order to account for that possibility. In fact, Harrington does suggest it, that if you have backdoor outs, you take one out away or something like that. So that's a really good point, though. I like hearing that, and, and uh, it's a good way of thinking. So. We're going to use our simple convert to odds against 100 divided by 62 minus 1, 1 1.6 minus 1 is 0.6 to 1. Okay, so the odds against are less than 1 to 1, and that's because we're a 62% favorite. Um, if we feel like it, we can calculate the pot odds, but if you have 18 outs, you're always calling. Uh, so 200 to call, 400 in the pot after the bet, so 2 to 1 pot odds. Those aren't really great pot odds, right? But 
you're, you're such a favorite in the hand that you're always going to call there. Okay. So, let me look. We have a little bit of time, and Steve and I were having lunch, and I told him that after he was done talking, I was going to kind of clean up a little bit with the pot odds, and then I was going to talk about poker moves. And the first thing he said is, are you doing the stop and go? And I love the stop and go, and I should do the stop and go, but I hadn't done the stop and go. But I had about 20 minutes before class started when we got here, so I added a slide for the stop and go. So we're going to do the stop and go. Uh, who knows what a stop and go is besides like a convenience store? All right, so here's the situation. And remember, I made these slides 20 minutes before class. They may not be polished. I don't have a, a little pun for the picture in the, in the corner like I've tried to do. Um, so you're in a tournament, and you have less than 10 big blinds. And you really should be going all in soon, right? Right? Yes. OK. And a player in middle position is raising, and you're in the big blind. OK, so that's a pretty good spot for you to go all in, right? There's extra chips called dead money in the pot. You've got the blinds, the annies, and the bet that the person just put in there. And you could shove here, but you're concerned because the guy that made that raise is a super big stack. And he can afford to call you, and you're going to go out. And he probably is going to call you because you've seen him in that spot all day calling people. And you're not very comfortable shoving there. So what you could do is call the stop and grow. Instead, you call the raise. You don't you don't raise or shove or anything, and this is contrary to like textbook ABC poker, right? Because what you really should do mathematically there is always shove, but you don't. So stop and go. You call the raise, and then you close your eyes, and after you're, someone tells you that the flop came, you shove all your chips in. Okay, the last thing you want to do is see the flop and get scared by it. If you commit to a stop and go, you shove. It's just like you could have shoved pre-flop, but you're going to see the flop first. But think about this, 70% of the time your opponent will miss the flop, and if they didn't already have a pair, they might actually fold. And so there might be a bigger chance that they're going to fold to your stop and go than they would have folded to your initial bet. Does everybody see that? Did I get it right? Uh, yes, you did. The only thing I was questioning is about the, the number of big blinds there. So what point do you shove on the big blinds? I think it's almost 20. 20. Well, I agree that if there's a raise in front of you, that it's 15 yeah. to 20. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think, though, if you're, if you, you could open shove with 10, and if you're below 10, you just need to shove. And I think if it's 20 big blinds, you could also probably do that in the, uh, in the small blind as well. With mm -hmm. 10 blinds, if you do it in the small blind, the big blind's probably going to call because of pot odds. Right. Maybe. Right. I, I like this move a lot more in the big yeah. blind than the small blind, but if you're super short, uh, you don't have a lot of time. This has worked for me several times, and I've actually, you know, thought it through. I was like, all right, you raised, I don't have a whole lot. Don't forget to stop and go here, and it and it's worked several times. Yeah, and I think the stop and go is becoming more popular, and so in that sense, it's a little dangerous to do it because if the big stack who put in the initial raise is onto you that you're doing a stop and go. Uh, then they're more likely to call you. So I think when, when Stop and Go was new, it worked a lot better, and it's starting to kind of go the other way. So use it with caution. But as those of you that played last night know, when you're down to 10 big blinds, you know, you're going you're gonna to be out soon. So you need to do so. You need to double up or you need to start stealing. OK. Uh, another one is the first in bluff. And this is basically directly out of Harrington. So uh, basically, when you have a bunch of people in a pot, and you know that the players are likely to miss the flop very often. Whoever bets first gets the advantage. Even multi-way, you often find whoever's aggressive is just going to take it down. When I play cash games up, like meaning I play in the higher stakes than I'm normally used to, I notice that those guys, if, if nobody seems interested in the pot, they're going for it, right? They're going to take the pot away. Uh, be a little careful about doing this one in tournaments. I think it's more of a cash game thing. Um, and if you... If you don't take it down with your first in bluff, you're taking the betting lead, which means that you might be able to take it on a later street. Now, pay attention to who's stabbing at pots, because if other players like to do the first in bluff, then when you notice that someone has that tendency and you see them do that, then you can come in and raise them. All right, I want to show you two more moves. Uh, I've got about three minutes. I may go into my time bank a little bit here. I've banked a few minutes with you guys. Um, this one is the float. So say that you're in position. And I wouldn't do this float out of position. And you have an opponent who raised preflop and you called. And your hand is queen 10 of diamonds. And let's say now that the flop comes 3, 6, 8. 
And your opponent, remember, you're in position, so your opponent acts first, so they lead out with a continuation bet. And what do you have now? I mean, you have nothing, right? And so you think this is probably a continuation bet and that he would continuation bet any flop. And you should be right about that. Players do that. And you know that he's an ABC player. So the float is that you're probably behind in the hand. You have queen high, after all, and your opponent was, was in the hand preflop. Presumably there was a raise and a call preflop. And probably this flop didn't improve his hand. It was 8-6-3. Uh, so the move is just to call. And you're not calling for value. Normally you call if you think you have the best hand or the right pot odds. But you're calling to make a move. And you're calling in order to steal later. Because take it from his perspective, right? Say that you made a raise preflop and you got called. You got low cards on the flop, you see bet, and the guy called you. And you're gonna think, well, this guy just called me. He must have an eight, or maybe he has something, but I'm kind of gonna slow down. So they'll often check the turn, and then that's when you bet the turn. And it doesn't matter if you have anything or not. Um, so if the turn is a low card, or say another six comes and it pairs the board, now you can try to steal it. So the conditions for floating are, are such that you have to make sure that these conditions are met. Don't just float any time. I don't like floating out of position. You mostly want to do it when your head's up. You really don't want to float against multiple players. Pick a player who continuation bets all the time and make sure that you have a, a solid table image. So if you're a bluffer, if you're playing really loose, or maybe you're catching a lot of cards and not having showdown so people think that you're really loose, you don't want to do this because that's kind of going to kind of give away that you're doing it. And then if you float and then you try to steal on the turn and you get raised, it's time to get out of there. Don't, don't double float, although that is a move that you can do. So the, um, the advance play is the two street float where you float the flop, they bet the turn again, you still have nothing, but you think you can take it away on the river, so you call, and then you try to take it away on the river. Um, have a video on this we're going to skip, but it will be in the online. Um, and now I want to talk about my favorite move, and probably the most common move that you'll see in a poker room, which is the squeeze. Who knows how to squeeze here in poker? Oh good, so I get to teach you something, because I think this is super, super important. Um, Here's how it works. So you're on the button, and an aggressive player in middle position opens for a three big blind raise. And then you have a straightforward player to his left who just calls. And now it's your turn, and what you can do is put in a big raise with garbage. So let me give you an example. It's a 2-5 game, and you've got big stacks, so you're playing deep. And the third position bets $20, and he's a lag. He's raising all kind of unopened pots. The fifth position player is a tag. Okay, he's a straightforward ABC player. He's just kind of boring, not creative, makes his $10 an hour at the poker tables, and he calls. Now you're on the button with six deuce off, okay? Horrible hand. And remember when I talked about garbage and I say throw your garbage away, don't ever play your garbage? Well, every once in a while you want to squeeze. So there's $47 in the pot. And you make it 125 to go. And you might say, I'm never putting in $125 into a pot when I've got $500 behind and two players have shown interest in the hand. Um, but I've actually done this many times, and it often works. What happens is it folds back to the original raiser, and he has a wide range of hands, right? You've got a lag who's been betting a lot. He just opened. Sure, he could have aces, but he also could have nine jack. He could also have, you know, seven, eight. He could have a pair of threes. There are all kinds of hands that this lag is going to open with. He knows that he's going to be out of position, and you just put in a big raise. And he's got to think, if he calls you, that you're going to see bet. So now he's committing a good chunk of his stack with a really wide range. Now, furthermore, this guy has to think that there's a player behind him, so that even if he just calls, the guy behind him who called his raise could raise again, and now he's lost $125. That's why it's called the squeeze, because that first guy that put in that initial raise, when it gets back to him, he still has a guy behind him who showed interest in the hand. And uh, the bet has to be very big, okay? So, you know, three big blinds in a 2-5 game is 15. So maybe it went, because people usually raise 20, maybe it went 20, 20, and now I'm on the button, I go 125. Um, and he'll fold most of the hands that he raised with. It'll work often enough to be worth it. And the original raiser folds, and now the action's to the caller. Now think about the caller. What's his range? Well, he saw, he's a good player, right? He's a regular, boring, but he's good. 
he saw the first guy open, and he's a lag, and he knows that first guy's gonna open with a super wide range. And he just called. He has almost anything there, right? I mean, if I've got 9, 10 suited, and I see a lag open, I'll just call, you know, let's see a flop, let's see what's going on, right? He doesn't have aces, kings, queens, jacks, he would have re-raised. Doesn't have ace, king, most likely, because a regular player is gonna do that. That's why it's important to categorize people and say, this guy's a lag, this guy's a tag, and he's boring, and he's regular. So you can rule out almost all the strongest holdings, which means they're not going to call a $125 bet. He doesn't want to go to war with an average hand. You can particularly do this if you've been folding a lot and your image is that you're a tag. So now, even if one of them calls and doesn't raise you, you can, you can then see bet on the flop and you'll win even more because they called your 125. Let's say that in this example, one of them calls you and the flop comes like this, and your opponent checks, because checking to the razor is something that you do, and now it's on you, and you bet $150. The ace was a good bluffing card for you. So what are the conditions for a squeeze? The first player has to open a wide range and be a decent player. Why decent? He has to be smart enough to fold when you make it 125. There are some players that never fold. Um, the second player has to be straightforward and not too tricky, and a call means that it's a call that he's kind of got a medium strength hand or less. Um, be careful if he's a really trappy player and you have to have a solid image, not viewed as wild. And the other thing is don't squeeze if you've been squeezing, right? Most players today at a poker table, if you go into a casino, you play one, three, two, five, they're very familiar with the squeeze. So if you see a bet and a call and a huge bet in position, almost everyone at the table is like, I wonder if he's squeezing. You do it three times, the next time you're going to get re-raised. Now, the, the beauty of that is that if you do that, then you can exploit it by pretending you're squeezing with aces. So normally, say that you have a $20 bet followed by a $20 call, and you have aces, you might make it 75, right? But you make it 125, 150, it looks like you're squeezing, like you don't want them to call, and then you can do that with aces. It's a little more advanced. You do it when you've been squeezing a bunch. So be on the lookout for squeeze plays, and it's okay for you to play back at someone if you think that they're squeezing. So you open an early position with jack-queen suited, not a great hand, but you feel like playing it. You get a call, guy on the button who has been squeezing all day long, and he's a really good, aggressive player, puts in the squeeze, and you just shove in your $500. It's awfully scary to do, but very effective, and it'll often work if you're right that they're squeezing. Okay. So um, let's go to the metagame tomorrow. I, I think I'm out of time. But uh, I want to thank again Steve for coming here. I really enjoyed your talk. I, I want to wish you all good luck tonight in the tournament at 7 o'clock. And I'll probably be watching late into the night. So if you're at that final table, uh, say hi in the chat. And I'll see you guys tomorrow.